right, so uh, thank you, Marty, for the introduction and all the other introductions. <laughs> I'm Frank Palmieri. I'm here from Langley Research Center. And uh, as you said, I'm, I'm the PI of the AeroBond project, which stands for Adhesive Free Bonding of Complex Composite Structures. And I hadn't planned on, on mentioning this at, at this point, but uh, just some words from, uh, from Jay Dreyer I heard during his introduction made me think of this. Um, he talked about making um, uh, solving lots of challenges for, for ODM vehicles for on-demand mobility and uh, he listed off, rattled off a bunch of challenges like uh, um, emissions and logistics and, and uh, flight uh, air traffic control and I'm probably going to get a pink slip on, on my desk on, on, uh, when I get back to Langley for saying this but uh, one of the things that gets overlooked it seems like with, with these challenges or with these types of vehicles is um, how are we going to build them and so the manufacturing is a, is a big challenge and that's what that's what Aerobond is all about, and it's it's a it's a commonly overlooked issue, but um, it's one that I hopefully you'll um, you'll see um, you'll see is a real problem after I describe um, what's going on here. So um, I want to first introduce my team members that make this work possible. Um, a big group that are all really uh, crack engineers that that uh, do good work. So I think you'll it'll be evident um, from the um, slides um, and from the talk what uh, what these what this group is doing and what uh, good work comes out of the team. So to understand the issue, we need to know um, what the size and scale of the, of the problem is. And so uh, in 2017, about 4 billion people took trips on, on passenger aircraft. And that's a big number, right? But, uh, but that number is expected to almost double in just the next, what, 15, 16 uh, years here. Um, so that's going to require a huge increase in the size of the industry means a lot of new aircraft need to be fabricated. Um, and it's not, just, it's not just an issue of getting more aircraft out there to carry all these new passengers. Um, we need to be able to do it, uh, we need to be able to do it uh, sustainably, right? So we need to make aircraft that are significantly more efficient so we uh, can, um, can be, have a sustainable industry of this size. So what does that mean? It means we need to have um, more efficient vehicles like these, air, these uh, vehicles that uh, that NASA has in concept, these blender wing body, and even these, um, these uh, electron, uh, VTOL or uh, E uh, battery driven aircraft like this uh, X-57 uh, aircraft that NASA is working on. Um, and to make these things happen, to make this work, we need to have them not just, not just these transformative designs, but we need to make them out of composite materials because the composites, uh, composite materials will allow you to have the, the efficiency in, in design uh, for strength and weight and safety to meet those uh, manufacturer to meet these uh, sustainability challenges, and as I mentioned, the scale. So we need to now make these structures out of composites, and we need to make them at huge scale. So we need to be able to manufacture um, large numbers of these vehicles, and so that means manufacturing rate becomes a critical a critical challenge, and that's where Aerobond comes in is manufacturing composite structures at high at high scale or high at high rate. <clears throat> so um, what is the challenge? What is the challenge with manufacturing at high rate? We could just go do it, right? We already built things out of composites. Well, when you look at this, when you look at these aircraft, you might be missing some of the details. Um, when you look inside, though, you see that aircrafts an aircraft structure is a really a complex thing. So, looking at maybe the inside of a wing, you see that there are several components that go together to make this this complex structure, and they're built up from these multiple components, um, usually by adhesive bonding. Because with adhesive bonding, you get the best performance. You get fast manufacturing. You get really strong bonds, you get really stiff joints, and that's how you get um, a high quality, um, efficient structure. But if you've ever done any adhesive bonding, um, you might be no notice an issue with that. And so you've probably done this around your house where you have something you need to fix, put together. You put a little glue on it, you stick it together, um, and most of the time it works great, right? Two things stick together and you get the product you want. But occasionally, um, for whatever reason, the glue doesn't stick, the thing falls back apart, and you look at it and go, huh, well, I wonder why that didn't stick. And um, researchers like myself have been thinking about this for decades and really centuries. Why don't two things sometimes stick together? These substrates should have stuck. Um, and that question has been a problem, is still a problem today, and it's still a problem in, on, in, on aircraft. So if you look at this, uh, this, air, uh, this aircraft that had an issue in 2005, it was an air transat flight where the rudder, um, a composite rudder, delaminated due to a, an, a weak bond in the, uh, in the structure and then caused the entire rudder to disintegrate during flight. Luckily, the aircraft um, landed with no injuries, but uh, this is the kind of thing you don't want to happen while you're flying somewhere. And so what does one do when, they're, when you're worried about having 
um, an adhesively bonded structure fail because of a weak bond? Um, well, I know what I do. I have a, a bike rack, for example, on my car where I carry my bike around, and when that broke and I wanted to fix it, um, I just said, okay, well, I can't just bond this together. I need to make sure it's not gonna fall apart and drop my bike on the road. So I went ahead and drilled holes through the part and, and added fasteners. And the FAA um, had the same idea. So now take that piece of wing in your aircraft and drill a bunch of holes through it because we need to add bolts and ensure that these bonded joints aren't gonna fall apart unexpectedly due to a weak bond, which occasionally does occur. <clears throat> um, so now multiply that across the entire aircraft. And this was work that actually came out of the Airbond project. Um, we, in the first year, we did an assessment of how many fasteners would go into a single aisle composite aircraft, um, specifically the wing. Um, we calculated this number of 21,000 bolts. And we also have a rust estimate for the number of fasteners that go, would go into a single aisle, um, 737 size composite aircraft. So this is something over, on the order of 100,000 fasteners, um, which translates to hundreds of hours of drilling and installation of these bolts into this composite structure, which is this is what's killing the manufacturing rate for composites. And so we need to find a way to get rid of these redundant fasteners or reduce these redundant fasteners as much as possible so we can go back to just being a bonded structure but still ensure the safety of the aircraft. So how do we do that? And that's where, that's where Aerobond technology comes into pl to play. So to understand what Aerobond is doing, you need to um, compare it directly with the bond process. That's what I'm doing on this chart where I'm showing on the left here um, <clears throat> two composite um, components. These are uh, pieces of uh, aircraft structure that are gonna be assembled with um, a sheet of adhesive shown in this uh, purple layer. And they go through some bonding process, which is usually a bake or some kind of cure at, at elevated temperature and pressure. And uh, when you do that, usually it works, right? You get, a, you get a bonded structure like I'm showing below. But if there's some, something in that bond line that causes this to be weak, this uh, joint can fall apart just like this Oreo cookie, right? So the, the, cake, the cookie um, peels off of the cream um, relatively easily and unexpectedly in some cases. Um, and so how do we prevent that? Well, in the Aerobond process, we, we put our materials onto the surface uh, much earlier in the process. So we're adding, we're adding our materials um, to the surface of the materials. We're adding our Aerobond materials to the surface of the composite components before they're made or during the fabrication process. And then such that um, during the manufacturing process after assembly, um, when they're combined, these, these layers are able to mix with each other um, because they remain, uh, remain mobile. They're able to mix with each other during assembly and, uh, and uh, allow us to create a joint with no, with no uh, discontinuities like we have in the adhesively bonded process. And this is analogous to these metal joint I'm showing in the bottom. I'm kind of struggling with this pointer here. But uh, these metal joints, um, when you weld them together, uh, you see that there's a continuous material through the joint and removes any kind of, any kind of uh, discontinuity like you have in the adhesive bond. And because you remove that discontinuity in the joint, you don't have a site for a weak bond to form. <clears throat> so what does that look like? Um, I'm trying to show you that in these, in these micrographs. That's the, the point of showing these, uh, these graphs here, which show, uh, compares the left side, the bonded joint, with the arrow bond joint in the center. And... Um, in the bonded joint, you see clearly there's two composite components that have been assembled with an adhesive layer. Um, if you look at that in, in, um, in a microscope in very close-up view, you can see the composite component on the top with the um, carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is clearly, um, clearly polished. So you see the round carbon fiber ends. And this, what I want to point out is this, this uh, line here, which is the bond line. That's the interface between the adhesive and the composite um, component. And that, it's that bond line that is susceptible to to failure because of um, un, un, uh, uh, sort of invisible, unpredictable, and, uh, and uh, immeasurable uh, levels of contamination that can form on that surface prior to bonding, um, creating a weak bond down the road. Um, with the Aerobond process, now if I look at a similar laminate that's been joined together using the Aerobond process, if I look at that in cross-section, um, maybe I shouldn't have put this, this word Aerobond joint across it because you can't see very clearly anymore <laughs> the joint, but what I'm trying to point out is that the resin the, flat, the polymer material between these carbon fibers is continuous from the part from from the part above, the on the top of the joint to the part below the joint. There's no there's no uh, bond line anymore in this in this joint because of the materials we're able to mix during the cure process, um, which is again analogous to this this uh, welded metal joint where you see continuous metal from one uh, side of the joint into the other. There's no there's no discrete um, 
there's no discrete line or interface. <clears throat> so how does this work? In a little more detail, at least. Um, still a cartoon, but I'm giving you the full details of the process. Essentially, it's two steps, a, a primary cure step and a secondary cure step. Um, in the primary cure step, we're adding our aerobond uh, materials to the surface of the part before it's, before it's cured and solidified. When we go through that solidification process, our materials mix into the surface such that there's no interface between the aerobond material and the part. Then um, in a secondary process, I mean, so these, these parts are now solid, right? So I can store them, handle them as I need to in the factory. Um, and then when I'm ready to, the manufacturer can uh, place them in contact with each other, assemble them such that the aerobond surfaces are in, are in good uh, intimate contact and then uh, go through a secondary cure process, the same as you would during any bonded assembly process. And so the way that works is you um, heat the material, and during the heating process, these air bond materials are able to mix with each other, and you see that in this graph as, it, as the, the two materials mix and become uh, green. And then once they've mixed thoroughly enough, they're able to, they're able to harden and cure and, go, and um, become a solid material, which also happens during that same cure process. Um, <clears throat> So uh, I'll just advance this because it's a little slow. But uh, that's the, the PowerPoint version of how this works. But what's really important is, you know, can you actually get material properties out of this, right? And so in the first year of our work with Aerobond, um, we've, been, we've been developing these materials and processes to make this work. And we're at the point now where we're making mechanical measurements of the properties. And what we're showing already is the, um, at least on this graph, I'm showing um, Aerobond joints having 90% um, properties in terms of fracture toughness um, measured by the n-notch flexure test um, compared to conventional materials. And you might stop and say, well, wait a minute, 90%? That's not 100%. Why aren't you as good as the conventional stuff? Um, and the, the understanding there is what well, we actually never tried to get. We never even thought we would achieve 100% um, of conventional material properties. That really wasn't our goal. Um, the goal is not to be stronger. No, nowhere in this talk have I said I want to make stronger materials or um, uh, tougher materials. Our goal is to make materials that are more reliable, right? We're trying to do, adhesives are already very, very strong. We're not going to beat their properties. What we're trying to do is be similar in property, but be certain about the, the nature of the, the bond so that we can't have an, un, we won't have an unpredictable weak bond. And so to drive that home, I just, uh, one more time to, to beat this to death. Um, the difference between the bond process and the aerobond process, it happens, um, comes in with the, the way they fail. And so a bonded joint essentially has two possible failure modes, um, a cohesive failure mode, which is the one you want. That's where the, um, the failure of the bond occurs by ripping the, the adhesive apart. This is a strong bond. It's hard to rip the adhesive apart. Um, but it is possible, just like that Oreo cookie, um, for the, the composite um, substrate to separate from the adhesive cleanly. This is a weak bond failure. This is unpredictable. This is the one we need to avoid. And with aerobond, because you have no interface where adhesive failure to occur, there is no adhesion. The only way this thing can fail is by a cohesive failure. Therefore, it's a predictable failure, uh, failure mode because you can quantify the properties of the aerobond material um, <clears throat> and certify this material for, for structural parts. So um, if we understand all that, then the only real, real thing left to do is to get this, this technology to market, right? <laughs> so here we are all the way on the left. Um, um, in this chart, at doing the doing the research and development at NASA, um, but that doesn't do a lot of good until we unless we can infuse it to the right into into the market. And um, the good thing about uh, where we are right now is we've already made um, contacts with a small company um, known as ASX Composites. Um, their materials, their materials, uh, composite materials, aerospace materials development company, and um, they've purchased a license for this technology for. Um, uh, for uh, experimental development of the of the technology, um, with uh, so it's a oh man I'm sorry I'm losing the word not a non an inexclusive or non exclusive license to to develop the technology um, <clears throat> and it's a small business so they're willing to work with us and do some some developmental research on the technology but uh, the good thing about this company is they already have ties to larger material vendors such as Hexel and Huntsman. And so when they, if we reach the point where this material is ready for sale, they can make contacts with their, with their vendors or with their um, suppliers to have them make large volumes of the material as needed. And those, those suppliers have contacts directly, of course, with, with the aerospace manufacturers like Boeing or if, it go, if we use this for, um, for ODM vehicle fabrication, maybe a company like Joby Aviation 
would be buying these materials or even outside of the aviation industry, for example, um, in uh, uh, automotive industry like GM is incorporating more and more composites in their structures and they might be interested in this technology. And even um, wind turbines, which are large composite structures in many cases, um, could be fabricated by GE using this technology. So I think that brings me to the end of my, my slides and the end of my discussion. And I guess we have plenty of time for, for questions, so please give them to me. Thank you. So I'd like to, so I, uh, I'd like to introduce PK. Uh, PK is going to help uh, moderate the Q and A session here. So um, I'll leave it to him. So we have about 15 minutes or so, uh, and uh, I know we've got some of the VCs are just uh, kind of getting here. So if we, we can have them up first and uh, go from there. Go ahead. All right, so now, um, thank you. That was a great presentation. So it's our job to ask him questions. Um, some of them will be friendly, some of them maybe not so friendly. Uh, but the first question we will uh, uh, start off with, uh, I'm going off the conference IO. This question actually is for, uh, Jay Dreyer and Dr. John Kowalowski. This is a tough one. So, but, if I may, um, just to get the room warmed up a little bit. So, this is Jay Dreyer and John Kowalowski both mentioned valuing, trying new approaches and learning. Great. So, that's definitely a compliment there. Uh, but, <laughs> next part of that is how does, um, <clears throat> how does this uh, value manifest itself in terms of uh, program leadership? It seems that we value if the technology transferred and or can demonstrate a specific performance benefit. We all agree that this is the main reason why we are here. We means NASA, I suppose. Uh, however, we are also in need of uh, keeping up with the current best innovative approaches so that we have sustained innovative technologies. It is not obvious how learning new uh, innovative methods is valued, where is it funded, how will this be measured in terms of typical desire for quantifiable project performance numbers. Um, so this is a question, I don't think you need to necessarily answer it right away, something to think about, but if you want to, you are welcome to, otherwise throughout the day you will have opportunities to answer it. It's a bit unfair to start off answering a question to the keynote speakers, but in NASA style, in open communication. Right. Um, yeah. you know, no good deed goes unpunished, I get it. Well, um, but there's an opportunity at the close of the day uh, where uh, Isaac and I are gonna take a little bit of time to talk about what we reflect, reflected on. And I think that uh, in, the, in the sense of all of the activities that we'll be hearing about. I'm going to be prepared to make a few comments on just what this means in terms of the infusion of this work or the opportunity for infusion of this work into our larger portfolio. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, value is, is in part coming from what it is that we will be doing with this work. Um, but again, I don't want to downplay the fact as the uh, author of the, uh, the question indicated that moving this to industry, uh, or any of these things to industry, is going to be also a uh, high priority element for you. Yeah, so the, 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 the answer there is transition inside the projects or programs is just one path. That is not the only path. And now we have other paths. This is why we have uh, accelerated our um, communications and understanding with the venture capitalist world and how they actually embrace technology infusion outside. So 
the idea is to obviously uh, if if it still needs further maturity in the research it goes through could go through conventional path in some inside NASA programs but it doesn't you can go outside NASA programs for transition as you have already started right so so Frank uh, <clears throat> I will start off with some tough questions, so let's see. What's the most, um, if you are, a, I'm gonna act like I'm VC. Uh, I work for government, I don't have any money, but I'll act like one. Uh, so what generates the most excitement for you about this particular idea? The most excitement, um, it's on. can everybody hear me? So, closer? Testing? Oh, that's better. So uh, as far as excitement, um, for me, I mean, I'm, I'm down in the weeds in, in the research. So the exciting part for me is, is seeing um, the idea, the concept that um, I, I personally thought was pretty far-fetched when I, when I first pitched it. I see data now coming out of the research that's making it look like we're going to meet our feasibility goals. And uh, to me, that's, that's really exciting because just seeing that it may be possible to, to achieve the um, – to achieve those goals is, is more than I expected. <laughs> uh, good. Perhaps. So maybe I shouldn't have said that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what's the likely chance of success and failure? Um, at this point, a year in, I think we're, um, from what I've been seeing, I think we're almost certain to succeed with our feasibility goals. As far I, as full success of the product, product getting infused in, um, into, into um, manufacturing, um, I still see certification as a huge challenge, and I and I think that that's something that together NASA and um, and uh, and industry need to tackle together. And do you, what are the risks, uh, or what are the likely chances of not going forward after one year? Um, the likely chances of not of, going of, forward of of not just learning and not being successful or making. It. Um, anything out of someone making money at the goal at, or at the saving end, life or whatever it is that the great mission that right, you're after, yes. right? So um, at the end of the next year, I think it's a hundred percent certain there'll be there'll be no revenue generated. <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as going forward with um, the technology, I mean, so certification is is the barrier, right, to getting this getting this uh, material into aircraft, um, and so it probably to will have to be demonstrated on on. Uh, uh, non-primary structure, less critical, ap critical applications first. Um, and I, I think there are, there are great opportunities to, to do that in, in fields like the, the wind turbine and, mm -hmm. and uh, automotive you know, vehicle industry. And I hope to see those things spin up very soon. As, um, getting into aerospace, I think, is, is going to be is a challenge with any new material and will always take you know, multiple years as far as you know, certification. It, but if we do have this, um, we do a path forward with our, with uh, materials vendors for aerospace, we already are starting that. So if that does materialize, I think that is, there's a chance, there's a good chance that we can pr um, propel that forward um, and, you know, work towards certification. Okay, so I'll uh, go to a question from the audience and then I'll go to the, uh, the table here. You stated that the predictability of the bond was what you were going for, but you showed the strength uh, uh, comparison. Do you have metrics associated with that predictability of the bond? Um, so we don't have uh, a metric right now for for predictability. Um, I guess predictability would be some statistic based on doing a large number of tests and a yield, getting a yield value. Um, these these are the kind of tests you do for certification. So you would make a, a, a large data set and measure the properties for a certain amount of a certain number of specimens and then get a, do a statistical analysis to get an allowables number for that material um, that is something that we would love to do but probably don't have the, the bandwidth in in a feasibility study like CAS uh, allows us to do um, that would be follow-on work but uh, the benefit of aerobonds is it allows you to do that type of work if you have a bonded joint um, because you're dependent on on that interface for adhesion, that's not something that you can you can make a um, easily make a, a measurement of, right? There's no um, there's no material there to measure the property of at that interface. It's you can measure the 
you can certify the adhesive, you can certify the substrate, but you can't certify the interface. And um, with Aerobond, the benefit is there is no interface, and you, you can, certify the, can certify the material. Okay, thank you. Can I come back to you guys and say if you want to? So, um, any feedback, guys, positive, negative, is welcome. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. So, I, I think I, I like the approach that you're um, already engaging with people out in the industry because I think some of the questions I have, um, you probably, as you just said, you probably don't have the, the facilities or the capability to fully. Uh, you know, verify those things. Um, so I'm not a materials expert, but you mentioned 90% of uh, uh, a measure that you use that, that but getting 100% of that wasn't the target anyway. So how do you, is there some quantitative way that you can represent how good this is versus conventional, um, you know, methods used? Um, or materials used, I guess that would be a question. And, and if you if that's something that you cannot do, then you probably can work with a, uh, a GM or one of the automotive guys, one of the uh, aeronautics guys to, to do that. So that, that was one question um, that I had. Um, and, and then relating to that, um, does this impact the manufacturing process of, of a vehicle or, or a aircraft or whatever they use today, and then coupled with both of those is the question of cost, right? Uh, you clearly have a benefit once you're able to prove that, uh, but what what is the, the sort of the rough uh, uh, cost that, that gets impacted? And, and those are, I think, all good things to find out. You probably don't have the facilities to, to do that here, but I would say working with partners, those are some of the things that you should probably get at. Thank you. That's three, at least three questions I, try, he, <laughs> I just tried to get yeah, track he, of. He, he must uh, have gone to generalistic school because <laughs> you can ask three questions in one prompt. Um, <laughs> I think the first one was about, was about um, comparison, um, comparison of the performance. And uh, I tried to show that in the, the results we, we compared, we're comparing directly to um, conventional materials. We don't compare to bonded joints. That's not the comparison because the, the bonded joint suffers from the issue of of the, the potential weak bond that we can't we can't compare to that directly because again that would be a that would be a statistical measure of, of you know how many how many work versus how many don't um, our technology is based on the based on the, the the idea that all of them should work because they're all the same they're all they're not there's no chance of this um, interfacial failure um, they all have the same material properties and then that you would benchmark against what we're trying to benchmark against is conventional materials meaning you know how how strong is a is a is a laminate itself. So if we have a, a composite made out of um, epoxy and, and carbon fiber, we measure the properties of of peeling apart that epoxy carbon fiber laminate, and then we 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 compare our aerobond the joint to those same properties. So, we, so when we say we're ninety percent, we're ninety percent of the performance of of um, a commercial uh, commercial composite material that um, was broken in the same manner, um, and. There are a lot more tests than, of course, than what I showed you. We would be testing um, uh, a series of, of, and actually in this feasibility study, we plan to test a series of different joint configurations and make comparisons to uh, the baseline uh, commercial properties um, that, are, that are already out there. Um, and I believe the second. <laughs> manufacturing process. Uh, oh, the so manufacturing yeah. process, right. How this differs or how this changes manufacturing. So our, our, our our goal was right to, was to speed up manufacturing, so we can't be adding a lot of, of steps, right? Yeah. And so if you looked at that um, chart, it's kind of misleading. It looks like aerobond is two steps and bonding is, is one steps, but it's not. That's not really the case, right? I, I was skipping a step for bonding because I started I started a step back in in aerobond, right? So you need to make manufacturers still need to make those composite components before they assemble them. Even if you do a bonding process, you still need to make the components, right? All I was saying is with with aerobond, you go back a step. When you're making the component, you apply our materials to the to the part before it's even formed, right? Um, you still have two steps, right? Make the part, assemble the part. That doesn't change for Aerobond. It's still a two-step process. Make the part, assemble the part. The only thing that's really been added to the process is now they have an extra material set that needs to go on the surface. So you would lay up your process in the same way you would to make any any aircraft component. Um, and then when you're 
you're you're finished with that layout process before you before you um, harden the part you would apply a layer of material our material um, to the surfaces where there's going to be a joint and that's the only addition so there's an additional material um, that they have to have on hand and then um, a single a single application of this material so it's not it's not much different than things they're already doing for bond preparation a lot of times um, manufacturers are already applying a layer of material to the surface um, they call it peel fly which just adds roughness to the surface to prepare it for bonding so they're already doing that they could throw that process out and use our process instead and not really add any complexity to the manufacturing so this is a good question I like this question oh I have a little bit of manufacturing background so I <laughs> will ask that question there was one more thing oh yeah go ahead you yeah third one pa part C part C you get extra credit for that Remind remembering that well, it sort of relates to some of the some of the points you just touched on. Okay, right? it's cost. So cost is the, the cost, right? Both materials. Uh, but, but I did want to touch on that side. I, I thought of my response to that already. So, um, as far as cost, um, when we when we're developing the Aerobond materials we use, we're we're using we're starting from conventional materials. So we take we take what's already out there and being used in aircraft components, and we're just modifying them um, as minimally as possible. So as far as cost, they're going to be um, they're going to cost probably the same as far as, as, far, as far as material, raw, com raw components, the, the cost will be about the same as what they're already paying for the materials. There may be some additional cost as far as processing because the processing is a little, more, um, a little bit more complex, but it shouldn't be a significant increase because we're talking about you know, an additional, an ad an additional um, uh, pre-breaking process, if that means anything to anybody, but an extra, an extra layer of material being, being added, right? So it's, uh, it's you know, one, uh, how would you percent wise maybe it's a, a, a couple percent extra um, material in the structure or something like that okay so, thanks so as a VC let me just ask you a funny question how do you rate his confidence level right now answering that his question confidence yeah that was pretty good great. I mean. See? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a question for you Frank are there any advantages to this technology for repairability can the two-phase cure process be used with patches and maybe heat guns um, patches and heat guns? Yeah. For repair? Yeah, repair. Um, I don't see how it works in repair because you need, for repair, you already have a solid structure. Mm -hmm. And for the Aerobond process to work, um, you need to be starting from um, the raw materials, right? We're applying our materials before you've, before you've made this solid structure. Um, so for repair, it, no, it's for new assembly. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Would you like... Uh, Okay. Uh, I got a question. This is slightly maybe unconventional, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, another industry that uses a lot of screws and would love to get rid of them is uh, the hard disk drive industry. And I represent that industry. And uh, there are two problems that are associated with hard drives. Whatever bonding you use have to be able to contain helium because drives have helium. So my, one of my questions would be, is your bond impervious to helium? And the second one, in the process of curing, if the bond outgasses, then that will damage the internal components. Uh, do you have any comment on uh, uh, those two fronts, how it might work or not work? Um, it's Helium goes through pretty much um, everything. <laughs> Maybe not steel, right? So um, uh, polymers are probably are probably tough as far as stopping helium. We, so our system is epoxy based. I imagine permeability to helium is is non negligible. Um, um, you could take the fiber out if it's a hard drive. I imagine you don't need carbon fiber mechan for the mechanical properties. That would help probably because the fibers are like straws. Um, uh, as far as uh, outgassing. outgassing, they're designed to be low outgassing materials, right? So the outgassing is also really bad in fabricating of, of aircraft structures because porosity is, is going to really um, knock down your properties. So some outgassing is already limited. So from an outgassing standpoint, it shouldn't be an issue. But, um, but I think permeability could be a challenge. Maybe if it's a very thin bond line, it, it wouldn't be an issue. I'm not sure. I, I guess I'm not exactly – I don't have any – um, knowledge about how the hard drives are being assembled and, and where this material would go. So, um, if they're if they're made out of if the whole drive is made out of out of metal, um, it's not ready for that kind of purpose. The whole drive, the whole case would have to be made out of 
how to do this epoxy material for the for our technology to be applicable. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so let's see, Peter, you want to ask any question? Um, well, so you know, as we were going through the um, the preparation for this and the formulation of the presentation, um, one of the questions that came up in my mind was, even if you look within the classifications of resins that are used today, there are so many different formulations for use under different conditions. And for me, one of the questions would be, as we take this work forward, it goes into an applications development phase where how do we explore the applicability of this against all of those different resins and against all of those different um, bonding techniques to gather data to know, okay, is this broadly applicable to all of them? or should we focus in on certain areas? And how, how do you think about what that, what that process would look like going forward from here? I guess, um, so we, when we started this project, I mean, it's all aerospace focused. So the material set we were interested in were um, thermoset epoxies, aromatic thermoset epoxies that cure at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a pretty specific um, application, but it's, kind of ubiquitous in composites for, for mm -hmm. aerospace. Mm -hmm. We're talking about materials for other applications. Give me a mm -hmm. hint, maybe. Well, it could be something you know outside of aerospace. It could be an automotive. It could be. So I think that's that's not, an, and so there's, it's potentially applicable to other other resin systems as long as they're, they're thermosets. I think that's kind of the limitation for our technology. It needs to be a thermoset material, meaning, meaning it's the type of material that um, you mix them, you bake them, they get hard. Not the kind of material where it's already hard and you heat it up and you form it and you cool it down and it becomes hard again. It's not a, it's not a moldable, remoldable um, plastic like your milk jug, right? Okay, so, so is it indicative that it would be equally effective with any thermoset resin? Potentially, it's nothing we've explored. Right. Um, so we'll, we've, we're working with epoxy chemistry, but there's the, the way that the way the technology works is, is potentially applicable to any any two-part system so an a b type um any a b so if you think about when you go to the, the store and you get those tubes of adhesive and you, you squirt some out and you mix it together as a and b mixed together so it reacts we're using we're, we're, we're working with this type of technology so there are a lot of different resin systems that use that type of chemistry so okay yeah well okay all right well, this is Harry Partridge. Uh, do you have any, um, uh, have you done any NDE to verify your bond? Absolutely. Every, uh, every joint we make goes through uh, ultrasonic tomography. And it verifies the bond? Um, so we've seen, so yeah, so when we, when we have a, um, a poor process, we'll see, we'll see open, you know, disconnects. And then when we, when we, uh, when we get a joint, we'll see a, um, we'll see a you know, transparent, you know, not, no, no signal, no bounce back from our, from our. Um, Have you done CAT scans to show the, uh, to look at it and see what the variation is across the, the, the bond? There's, we haven't done any X-ray work. Is that what you're? Yeah, the CT scans. No X-ray, no. Is it a diffusion type bonding mechanism? Diffusion is required. Yeah, the mixing is by diffusion. Okay, that has failure modes. You don't see any of those failure modes. Um, so the failure modes that we've observed are all cohesive failure modes. In the in the resin, um, usually along the the the, um, the, the uh, fiber surface, okay, fiber thank bed you. surface. Oh, that's Harry Partridge. He's, to my knowledge, he's written maximum number of papers in probably any NASA civil server. How many? Five hundred plus papers. <laughs> so any. Um, any last, uh, one second, I want to just wrap it, wrap it up with any last minute advice, last advice for him. If we were to go in the outside world, uh, what would be your advice to him? Yeah, the, the your point about the inability to repair kind of struck me. Um, I don't know how you view that in your application, but uh, repair, be able to repair is, uh, I think it's important. I, I think uh, in sorry. a world of uh, socially responsible technology. Yeah, sorry, that's but perhaps it was a um, mis misspeak on, on my behalf. The composite structure can still be repaired. Our technology does not enhance the repair te the technologies that are already available. So you would still have to repair using, sadly, an adhesive bond. 
Um, and if you're uncertain of that adhesive bond, then you probably want to install fasteners again, right? Um, our technology can't enhance, can't enhance the current available repair techniques. Is that something you'd work on? Because uh, I'm thinking of my dental implant. Right? <laughs> they, they, can, they can hold something and take it out. Yeah. Um, the, the problem is, is you'd have to grow a new tooth for our technology to... <laughs> and then we, before it grows, we would, we would get involved. But... So that's that's so the, the the technology requires that it become becoming um, to to apply our joining technology requires to be a new part. Um, yeah. So my advice would be, I, I think you're doing all the right things. I I would encourage you to get out and uh, you know strike those partnerships or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call them, so that you can validate all of this. Um, while you might have. Um, uh, certain shortcomings of the environment that you're in, you know, most of these early stage ven ventures can't even do what you're doing because they don't have the funding to, to get through that phase, right? And mm -hmm. then they go to this step two. Um, you don't have that issue. Um, so I would, I would do that and, and, you know, it'll get all those questions answered. I asked you three, but there's probably another yeah. 55. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm really hopeful with the partnership we're, we're starting out in because, um, they're, they specialize in, in fabricating the type, type of materials we're interested in. Yeah. And so that'll take away a lot of the questions we have with our in-house fabrication, which is done in, in a research facility, not a real industrial yeah. fabrication yeah. facility. So they'll, they'll solve a lot of our, our processing questions. Yeah, so I mean, I, we can also, you probably know this, Advanced Composite Manufacturers Association, we can probably expose you to that. And That'd be great. So, yeah. So we know some people there. We can probably hook you up. Great, Peter. Last comment. Yeah, my f my feedback echoes that that um, a, a plan around applications development to have you know the capability to gather the data on the performance of this, validate what you've seen so far, and to do it in a way that's specific to the applications you're targeting. Find a partner that is aligned um, on the need for that and bring some resources to help do it. So thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Any, do you have any questions for them? <laughs> How many of you are willing to invest in him? <laughs> no, no, you can do Taking that. Taking up a collection. Now. Yeah, we'll exactly. Pass a but but I, one thing I forgot to do, which is to introduce the, the panel here. So, Srini, may I request you to kind of give you just a quick background on... I'm not a public speaker. I wrote it down, but forget <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, I'm a technology leader skilled in inventing, staging, and productizing precision motion control systems for disk drives. Uh, I had a 14-year tenure at WD, Western Digital, uh, where my team uh, deployed the first autonomous lights out manufacturing process for disk drives. Uh, we've made uh, more than a billion drives, saved more than a billion dollars uh, through CapEx and OpEx savings. And uh, we were able to reach uh, 1,000 DPPM uh, prime yields, which was, uh, which was, I think, an achievement. Um, but since then, I have uh, diverted at least part of my attention through uh, my company, Selstra LLC, to look at uh, autonomous drone technologies that can uh, uh, relieve humans of uh, tedious, repetitive, and treacherous tasks uh, in a socially responsible manner. And uh, I'm here to learn. I look forward to a very enjoyable conference. Yeah, you will get a couple of good topics. Uh, next two, actually, back to back, will be very, very uh, pertinent to your drone things. So, Viren, please. Hi. Um, so I'm Viren Pereira. Um, spent uh, a few decades in in the high tech industry here in Silicon Valley. Um, several early stage companies uh, that we started, and and then bigger companies. I was commented to my wife that. Uh, Every single company that I've worked for, whether it's uh, an early stage company or a larger company, in name at least, doesn't exist anymore because of the consolidation of the industry. It's quite amazing. 
But anyway, some of those, some of you might recognize these. I ran the data comm business at a company called PMC Sierra that was uh, in the late 90s. Uh, ran the optical business, uh, communications business at a company called JDSU that's now called uh, Lumentum uh, and VRV Solutions. Um, I was at Micrell. I ran their uh, networking business there. So uh, not really material stuff, but we pioneered automotive Ethernet and a lot of the uh, high-speed networks in, in automotive there, working with companies like BMW. Um, and then uh, several different early-stage companies like Stream Machine. We made the first uh, single-chip video encoder that enabled uh, video encoding to go from authoring studios into consumer products. Today, you know what a TiVo box is, but in those days, nobody knew what that was. And uh, so uh, um, we enabled some of those things. Um, also run my own uh, strategy and consulting business at one time, helping VCs with multiple early stage investments and so on. Today, mostly at ON, I run the IoT business for us. So um, very exciting field there. So. Like Sri, I'm here to listen and learn. I'm not too familiar with what you guys do, but I'm sure you do really good stuff. Thank you. Hi, I'm Peter Shannon. Uh, I run a, um, a fund that is focused on investing in mobility and aerospace. Um, we look at the intersection of electric propulsion and increasing autonomy on what that means for flight, whether very small air vehicles up to passenger carrying, cargo carrying, and even larger um, aircraft. Um, prior to that, uh, I'm an engineer by training, software development, software development in my background. Um, early in my career, I pioneered software that would enable a computer through machine vision um, to uh, recognize the human eye and then uh, figure out what direction it's looking in. So the early instantation, uh, instantiations of eye tracking. Um, I've been in the venture business for about 14 years now, uh, have looked at opportunities across all aspects of uh, software and technology investing. I've also spent about 10 years in uh, sustainability technologies. So those, those would include energy efficiency, renewable energy, um, uh, uh, clean fuels, and uh, specifically transportation and mobility. And that is the, the background that led me into uh, focusing now on this opportunity in new technology impacting uh, air mobility. Um, one of my specific areas of focus within this space is how this new technology is creating new capabilities in flight that will be applied towards moving people or moving goods and the implications for what that means for our world's transportation systems. Um, in other words, how this type of technology scaled up and applied can create a really powerful complement to existing ground-based transportation networks. So we spend time looking at the enabling technologies on this side. We track a lot of what's going on in vehicle development, but we spend a lot of our time on the networks and the geospatial data and the systems that are going to increase the capacity and capability of the national airspace system and the systems that will create the backbone of future mobility networks based on all of that. And so that is you know, drawing a lot on our software background and um, uh, you know, a major area of focus for us uh, right here. Okay, great. Thank you, panelists. And uh, we'll take a quick transition here and I'll hand it back to Marty to introduce the next speaker. You're welcome to stay here or sit there.